Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll be leading the walkthrough here. I'm Gonzalo. Um, I lead the smart contract work at Immunify. And yeah, let's get started and feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Yeah, let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so, thank you. Um, we are looking into the code of the Immunify protocol. This is essentially the arbitration protocol. Uh, it's a safe centric um, smart contract ecosystem. Safe centric in the sense that um, it, it, the components work around the Gnosis safe contract. Um, the Gnosis safe itself is not in scope, but as you will see, many components will be attached to safes or there will be often an assumption that it is a, a safe that is interacting with, with a protocol. Um, I will start through with, let me see here. Okay. Um, the idea, by the way, of the arbitration protocol is essentially to allow um, the calling of a third party arbitration to essentially issue a, a decision on a given report and enforce payments. Uh, that's That's basically it. So the key components for the protocol to have those powers is a guard and a module, which is what Gnosis Safe can allows in the code, basically. Uh, the guard in the Gnosis Safe contract uh, essentially is used to check every transaction that goes through the normal exact transaction uh, of Gnosis Safe. Uh, it, it, the only thing that it doesn't check is the, the transactions going through a module. So our Immunify Guard is quite essentially the Zodiac Scope Guard, uh, which I'll show in a bit. It just has this extra Guard Bypasser. And we also have the Emergency System, which basically we as I will go through as well, our emergency system, what it does is it decouples the guards and the modules uh, from all the existing vaults. That's what I will call the Gnosis safes. And that way all the vaults will, will be in one single, like um, in one single transaction will be detached from our protocol in case of some emergency. So this is a check transaction that that the vault will call when executing a transaction. And what it does here is if it is on an emergency state, it will return, meaning that it will allow uh, the execution of, of, of that transaction. Uh, the guard bypasser can also allow any, any transaction, but other than that, it will have a bunch of logic understanding what is the type of the of transaction, what's the operation, where is the transaction going to, and that's where the scope guard um, enters. So this is a scope guard, basically just the Zodiac scope guard with a few modifications. And essentially it allows uh, the owner to scope any potential transactions. So as you can see, you have all these functions set target allowed. Basically, uh, if if the target address of, of a transaction is not allowed, it will revert. Um, <clears throat> set delegate call allowed, set scoped allowed, which is just uh, telling whether the whether the the target uh, is only allowed for a certain uh, function signatures or maybe it's allowed for all the function signatures. 
fallback value, whether you can pass a value into that target, and allowed function. When it is scoped, it checks these allowed functions. Uh, these are just view functions, and the important critical logic here is this one. It is logic that has been uh, audited previously um, because it's uh, it's uh, it's code from from Zodiac. But the point here is that it just checks all those permissions and, and understands whether if it is a delegate call, is it allowed or not? If it has value, is that allowed? Um, is this function signature allowed, etc. So that's basically it on the Immunify Guard. And what it will do is it will scope the functions and the contracts that uh, a vault owner will be able to call. That's essentially it. Uh, now going to the Immunify module. The Immunify module, on the other hand, bypasses the Immunify guard, and it actually bypasses the signatures of the vault. That's what a module does on a Gnosis safe contract. And the, the, the contracts that are able to execute through the Immunify module will be uh, protocol components, essentially which will have this executor role um, granted to them. By the way, these have setups because um, these are all under, under proxies. And you, we have here the execute. Uh, it gets executed, and then it will execute the, the Gnosis safe, okay? Which I'll, I'll show in a bit. Uh, but this is also a modification from a, from a Zodiac module. And here, contrary to the guard, if we are on an emergency uh, shutdown, it will actually revert the transaction. So the guard allows it to pass, and the module reverts it. So effectively, it is detaching the guard and the module. So if, if we are at an emergency uh, shutdown, the module doesn't have any powers, and the guard doesn't do any scoping. So it becomes a, a vanilla a vanilla Gnosis safe, essentially. This exec is really just logic to execute the, the, the avatar, which is the, the name uh, that Zodiac grants to, to Gnosis safes. And here it is, exact transaction from module. And crucially as well, the the module itself, Immunify module, has a guard of its own potentially. Okay, but here it it will def it definitely will. So the Immunify guard is attached to vaults, but the Immunify module will have a guard as well, which is also a scope guard, so, which we've seen already. Okay. So once again, the functions called through, even the functions called through the Immunify module, they are scoped as well, just to make sure that, yes, okay, the, the caller needs to have this role, but also the caller cannot do anything. Uh, it can only call a very specific uh, set of functions. Okay. So we've been talking ab about the emergency system. Let's go into it. Uh, really, probably the, the simplest contract here. And it just turns on and off a flag. That's basically it. The idea of this was just to make the decoupling of vaults from the whole arbitration protocol as easy and cheap as possible, basically. So it just, it just changes a flag. And that's basically it. And and this flag will, will be will be read uh, on the Immunify module and the Immunify guard. Okay. Vault freezer. So there is a role in this protocol called the the freezer role, and this role allows uh, a given address to freeze a vault. We are going to see in more detail what that means to freeze a vault, but essentially 
uh, the vaults will, the owners of the vault will not be allowed to do a bunch of stuff. Namely, uh, the money should stay in the vault. At least it, it cannot be moved by the owners of the vault and a bunch of other things like they cannot uh, start time lock operations um, as we will see so again a very simple contract as well and we basically just said in a mapping uh, that a, a given vault is is frozen or we can also unfreeze the vault very simple contract also Okay, let's go to time lock. The time lock is, a as we are saying here, a component which enforces time locks on certain operations. And these operations will go uh, to the Immunify module. So for this to work, it means that the time lock actually needs to have this executor role. Okay, we have the documentation that specifies uh, who will have these roles? But yeah, uh, you can also. It's also clear from from the code. Hopefully, okay. We have the function queue transaction, and basically, um, what we are doing here is we are the time lock is agnostic to the specific operation that is being encoded. And the operation is encoded through basically the, the data that you should pass uh, to, um, to the vault. So the, the to address, the value, the, bait, the, the data of, of the call, the operation, essentially whether it's a delegate call or a, or a call, uh, the vault specifically, and we have cooldown and expiration as well. So we can set the cooldown and expiration, and this function is only callable by this cure role. Okay. Um, what it means is that we cannot allow anybody to call or even the owner call this um, with any arbitrary. Uh, data inputs because this will eventually be forwarded to the immunify module uh where is it in the execute transaction um here and even though the immunify module has the, the scope checks and and everything um still we we shouldn't allow that so we are going to see um what components will be able to to send operations to the to the time lock. Um, notice that we cannot um, time lock operations or calls when the vault is frozen. We have a nonce per vault. We encode the transaction. Uh, we say we store the the transaction hash, and that's essentially it. We we store also the the queue timestamp which will tell us when the cooldown has finished. That's essentially it. OK. We also just store a bunch of data uh, in, a, in a struct. That's just data that will be useful later on. And in the execute transaction, we check whether the transaction has been queued, meaning that hash um, exists and has been queued. Uh, the call, the, the cooldown has passed already. The transaction didn't expire. And here we do make a distinction and basically allow for um, expiration to be infinite, essentially. So no expiration. Then we decode the data. And notice that we are decoding the data uh of the transaction that was queued and one piece of that data is the vault address and here we make sure that the message sender is the vault in other words the owner of the vault is the one that is able to execute this transaction in the time lock okay because then the vault 
will execute it. Um, yeah, and then we change the state to executed and we do execute the operation. We can also cancel the transaction. And again, it needs to be the, the vault uh, that is calling this function. And we just change the state to canceled. And these are just some getter functions. And that's it. Now let's go to, uh, feel free to ask any questions, by the way, in the chat. Let's go to the withdrawal system. The withdrawal system is one of the, the components. Actually, right now, it's the only component that has the cure role. Uh, what is the cure role? Here it is, the cure role. So the withdrawal system will be able to queue operations to the time lock. It is currently the only component, but later we, we can deploy more components into the protocol and grant those components uh, the cure role as well, because the time lock is agnostic to, to the operations. So um, here, what, the, what a vault can do is queue a withdrawal. Essentially, we, we don't want the withdrawals to be sudden uh, in a vault. We want uh, there to be visibility and time to see um, that some some project is withdrawing money from a vault. Um, so the vault needs to queue that withdrawal. Notice that there's an assumption here that the message the message sender is the vault. So here here is maybe the first place where where things can go wrong. Essentially, uh, there is an assumption that that this message sender is the vault, but obviously we are not doing access control in this function, which means that actually, technically, anybody can call this function and it will be assumed that that message sender is a vault, but it actually isn't. So you uh, will need to look and see if you can actually uh, find some meaningful impact coming from this or whether um, this person will just be calling this and and spending gas fees essentially. Importantly, here we queue the transaction in the time lock and we queue it by specifying the data. And the data is this function, which I'm going to to show in a bit from the vault delegate, the parameters to the function, and the target is uh, that that contract, and it's a delegate call, and hence why this is called the vault delegate. You are going to see throughout the code that this contract will be used um, basically as an extension to the vaults, just to provide in certain cases um, more functionality to the vault. Instead of doing like a transfer to another component, it actually it is the vault that is delegating to some other contract. So let's jump into it. It is here in the common. And vault delegate, uh, this is inheriting from secure token transfer from Gnosis safe. And this is kind of, it, it, it inherits a little bit of its logic from the old splitter contract of Immunify. And there's a bunch of functions that are basically you, one a vault could use uh, to delegate to, which is the, the send tokens, which is basically just sending a token, an ERC20 token. Send a reward is the normal function to pay a reward. And here there's a fee, a potential fee that is also enforced. Um, and basically the fee comes from, from these vault fees and yeah, that's basically it. You can, you can do a payment with a bunch of different tokens with native token. So there's also potentially a lot of things, uh, that could go wrong here. Um, though a lot of it has been already, 
uh, battle, te battle tested uh, in the splitter. The send reward no fees is just the same as this function, except that no fees are enforced, which can be used by, by the arbitration component, which we'll see. And there's also the withdraw funds function called by the withdrawal system or referenced by the withdrawal system, which just sends out uh, tokens and native token amount to a given address. Okay. And that's basically it. So that's the vault delegate. The reward system is a very important component that uses the vault delegate. It is used by the both the vault or the vault owners and the arbitration component, which we'll see in a bit. So let me jump this enforce and reward and show this one first. This is just a normal function that a vault Notice that we are assuming, again, that the message sender is a vault. And the vault will use this function to pay a white hat normally. That's essentially it. And there's a bit of a weird um, pattern here that you, you, you can easily see, but it is, it is what it is. That's, that's how we did it. And notice that the vault will call this reward system, which will call the Immunify module, which itself will call the vault. So it is a bit of a circular um, execution call. Um, and that's basically it. Notice also that the vault cannot be frozen. And it, this function can only be used when the vault is not in arbitration. The enforce reward, for enforce and reward, and enforce and reward no fees, are, they are extremely similar. The difference being that one enforces with fees and other not. And it should be used by the enforcer role and can only be called when the vault is in arbitration. And that's basically it. The vault can be frozen. But importantly, it needs to be in arbitration for this enforcer to suddenly have powers. Um, I'm going to show the arb. Maybe let let me show first. I've I think I didn't end up showing the vault fees, which is just a contract that has a a mapping from vaults to fees, and also it has a default fee. And that's essentially it. It's not a very complex contract. It just the setter role is able to set a specific fee for that vault. So the vaulting theory can have uh, a zero fee. And yeah, uh, you need to account for that. For example, in the callings of send rewards and other other things. Arbitration. The arbitration will be the only component that has the enforcer role. So the only component able to enforce an execution through the module. And in its turn, that enforcement can only be done by this arbiter, which will be uh, an EOA, a multi-sig, or whoever, which has actual powers to to arbitrate, will be the arbiter, and to enforce uh, money to go from the vault to a white hat or to other entities. So we can all already look at it. Um, an arbitration needs to be open, and one can close or not uh, arbitration the same transaction. The reason for this is that an arbiter might want to, to perform uh, reward enforcements without uh, closing the arbitration yet. Um, and this uses the enforce and reward, which will enforce fees. There's also the enforce and reward no fees, which is the same thing, but doesn't enforce fees. 
enforce multiple rewards. Again, uh, this is where things can go wrong, uh, potentially. And there's here a for loop where basically multiple enforcements can be done in a single transaction. And arbitration can also uh, be closed. Uh, by the way, I'm all, always removing arbi the arbitration ID from Vault um, at the end of these functions because these enforce functions only work when the Vault is in arbitration. So I cannot remove the Vault from at least this arbitration uh, before. I need to remove it afterwards to make sure these functions get well executed. And we also have the functions used to request the arbitration. So we have a function for the white hat and a fun function for the vault. Uh, arguably, the arbitrations will be called most of the times by white hats and not uh, the vault. The request arbitration white hat, we have here. Um, some important things, which is this arbitration data gets added to a vault mapping, which which is telling you that a vault can have more than one ongoing arbitration, but to be in the state of in arbitration, it only needs to be to have one arbitration ID in this mapping or this list. Um, also importantly, we are validating a signature. So the color of this function doesn't need to be the white hat, but the signature needs to come from the white hat. So that is important. And this is just a, a distinction between the entity that is calling the, the function and therefore is paying for arbitration and the entity that is the white hat, the one who who reported, uh, and would win uh, uh, rewards in the arbitration potentially. Um, this is just to allow potential sponsoring or or anything. Uh, that's that that's basically it. And this signature checker upgradable. I'm not showing, but it's it's a uh, it's a dependency coming from OpenSaplet. The request arbitration vault. Another thing that can go wrong here is that once again we are assuming that the message sender is a vault, and then we do uh, things like we did in the previous one, except that we don't have a signature. We are assuming that the message sender is a vault, and we take uh, the fee. We take it from the vault itself. How do we do it? By executing a send tokens transaction from the vault. Right? So we directly access the Minify module, like the reward system does, and we send tokens um, to the fee recipient to cover for the arbitration which means that the vault needs to have that money. OK, um, so that was arbitration, probably the most important one. I say that the, the, the most important uh, thing that the, the system needs to be uh, secured against is basically all these functionality of enforcing and potentially stealing money from the vaults, right? So the vaults cannot, the vaults funds cannot be accessed by um, by anyone that doesn't have these specific roles. And the vaults, uh, the vault owner, the vault shouldn't be able to perform or operations that they are they are not allowed to. The final weird and potentially dangerous component is the reward time lock. So it is interesting here because this is a different reward system 
and also a different time lock. So it's a very specific uh, contract that also implements time locking operations, but we needed to understand the, the data of the operation, not be agnostic about that operation data. So we couldn't use the time lock. Um, so this should be used only when the vault is in arbitration. And what is this for? Essentially, the component allows a vault owner to still queue rewards or eventually execute reward transactions but while in arbitration. So a project could be in arbitration on report A, but on report B, that somebody, some white hat, uh, even if even though the vault is in arbitration, the white hat still decided to report uh, a bug there. And the project can queue a reward transaction to that uh, white hat. Okay. Even though the reward system is is not um it's not allowed to be executed by the vault anymore because it's now in arbitration what the vault owner can do is call through this reward time lock what it will do is it will enforce a cooldown much like the time lock and that cooldown is just just a preventive measure essentially to allow off-chain entities, like for example the 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 freezer role, to analyze that transaction and see, well, this vault is in arbitration, um, and a given amount of money, let's say one million dollars, is is at stake here, and this payout that the vault owners are trying to to execute is of $1 million as well, which would basically take all the money from the vault. So we could, we cannot allow that. So the vault freezer would either reach out to, to the project or uh, eventually um, freeze the vault so that the transaction cannot be executed. Alternatively, it could just be a small reward transaction, which doesn't put the arbitration uh, in danger and therefore uh, it can simply go smoothly. So the reward gets queued with a dollar amount. That's how um, payouts and Immunify get um, measured, essentially, or the currency. And But then on the execute reward transaction, the, the vault owner needs to input the tokens and the amounts and the native token amount, etc., and that calculation needs to be uh, at least pretty close to the dollar amount. Why are we doing this? Well, it's because if the cooldown, for example, is uh, a few days, then if the project, if the vault uh, queued an amount of tokens, then after a few days, maybe the tokens either pumped or lost uh, a ton of value and the reward would end up being um, much smaller or much larger than, than intended. So we are trying to, to prevent that. Once again, the vault needs to be an arbitration. The vault cannot be frozen. We are assuming that the message sender is the vault, the same vault that queued. The transaction. Uh, we do always we do also perform this this check that came from from an audit. Um, that's basically to prevent um, lingering reward transactions that got cooled down and not executed in an arbitration, and suddenly the vault. Um, um, was no longer in arbitration, but suddenly it was in arbitration. And then we would have a transaction that was just lingering there, uh, matured, and the vault could immediately uh, perform a transaction, which, is, which wouldn't be good. So we, we set here a, a cooldown um, 
as well. Like we we renovate the uh, the cooldown essentially. Um, in minify module execute, we can also cancel the transaction, and this is important. The check reward dollar value is just the normal um, checking of prices that one does with oracles. We incorporate basically chain link oracles, but we also allow um, for an arbitrary um, price feed. And everything is essentially uh, abstracted away through this price consumer. So that was it here. So let's go to the price consumer. We are getting close to the end here. Uh, where is it? Here. That price consumer <laughs> contract, uh, notice it is not a, a proxy. Um, it has a registry. <laughs> and this registry, um, it varies what this registry is uh, depending on the chain where the protocol is deployed. Uh, the reason for this is that if we deploy on mainnet, this feed registry will be Chainlink's feed registry, which essentially it works as a middle, la middle layer uh, between you as the consumer and every price feed that you want, essentially. So uh, when we do like, this get chain link price. Uh, we just call the registry with the base token and the quote token, and the registry will will fetch the the specific um, price feed that needs to fit to, that needs to fetch, and sends us <clears throat> the data. Excuse me. But on the layer two, uh, chain link do didn't doesn't deploy uh, the registry or or at least there is a bunch of layer twos where the registry is not deployed. Um, so in those cases, we need to uh, code our own registry to not change this. And here's an example uh, of a feed registry for the layer two where the sequencer uptime gets checked and we set a bunch of feeds uh, both in the constructor and here as well, potentially by the owner, so that the reg this registry would have uh, a lot of feeds to respond to to the price consumer. That's essentially it. And there's this uh, uptime feed check as well, which is important in in a layer two. In the price consumer, uh, there's also let me see. There's also. Uh, we we just allow uh, to have a custom feed in case, uh, for example, we either don't don't like the specific feed of of Chainlink because it doesn't have a lot of quality, or maybe Chainlink doesn't support a given feed. We can set a custom feed, and it should still follow this interface. So. If we, for example, want to support, I don't know, uh, Chronicle, uh, some Chronicle uh, price feed, we would have to deploy a, a price feed um, contract that, that implements this interface and basically becomes the, the, the middle layer between that new Oracle and, and this price consumer. Okay, now that was essentially it of the components. Uh, there's a bunch of other contracts that I didn't show. Uh, these are just, I guess, just used for organization purposes. Um, for example, these access control base module, access control guardable, the arbitration base. So a lot of, for example, the roles, uh, enum, structs, the storage layout, uh, the setters, they get, um, they are here organizing these base contracts. 
sometimes even uh yeah exactly some some view functions as well uh we have the encoders which is some functions um that that inherit from the base encoder some functions that just encode data that's essentially it the base encoder follows 7, 712 and we have contracts with the events uh, that's pretty much it finally we have uh the vault setup this is just a contract that helps us deploy a vault and set up a module and a guard doesn't deploy a vault really but it, it the on the deployment of the vault the gnosis safe setup should call this um which basically sets the module uh, and the guard these are just, uh, I guess the I don't remember, but the storage uh, slots. Yes, I've, no. These these are just the function signatures that need to be called. Um, yes, exactly. And we still have also this function, which is just very similar to to an Open Zeppelin one, uh, proxy admin ownable to step. The difference is that it's just uh, it's Open Zeppelin's proxy admin with open zeppelins ownable to step and that's it is there any question No questions. Okay. Uh, then we can close. Uh, thank you very much and good luck with hunting on the boost. And feel free to ask any questions on the channel. Cheers. <laughs>